been looking at the topic of how Christians can live a refreshed life, even with the many difficulties, uh, challenges, uh, pain, confusion, godlessness uh, that we face daily. While we haven't finished this series or uh, this topic, uh, I'd like for us to take a break today and look at a very important subject that is dear to all of us, and that subject is Father. Fathers. Today is Father's Day, you know, so uh, it's the third week of June, and so we want we, we set in aside this day to look up look up fathers. Today is Father's Day, another very special day which follows uh, on the heels of the recent special day uh, that we had, which was what Mother's Day in May, right? And uh, if we care to admit, Father's Day doesn't seem to be seen as special as Mother's Day, at least in terms of celebration. And we know that there are so many reasons why it is so. Sometimes it seems as if the occasion is usually uh, nothing but an afterthought, Father's Day. And so it is no surprise at all, because if I am right, while the celebration of Mother's Day started in 1907 or in the 1900s, let me put it that way, Father's Day wasn't officially recognized uh, until sometime much later. So maybe that contributes to the, to the fact that uh, Father's Day is not, it's not seen as uh, big as uh, other special days. But we thank God that a day has been set aside to, 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 to recognize and honor mothers and fathers because that's what the Bible teaches us in Ephesians chapter 6, honor your father and your mother, right? And we, we are taught that also in the Old Testament. So we are grateful that even secular society has put aside a time to, uh, to, to understand the importance of the role of the father and the, and, and the mother. Now, like, like I was saying, could it also be that maleness, masculinity, man, right? And its expressions in terms of fatherhood uh, are not respected. We know our society, we know the society in which we live across the world, and we know what's been going on when it comes to uh, the role of the man, you know, uh, the male figure in the lives of the people. Uh, because of some terrible uh, things, really, really terrible things that men have done in the past, especially in our society, Patriarchy is equated with the oppression of women. So, anytime we think about it, anytime society talks about men, it's always, it's almost always in, uh, uh, it's done in a context of uh, chauvinism. The men are always uh, domineering, dominating, trying to oppress women. We know that it's happened, we, 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 it's, it, it continues to happen, but we understand you or not, we understand it's because we live in the fallen world. But we will agree, we, we, you and I will agree at the same time that fathers also need recognition and compliments from their families and from society. Like I said this morning, I was surprised this morning when the church said, oh, pastor, we want to recognize you as a father and as a pastor. It was, it, it was a, 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 a surprise for me, but at the same time, too, I say thank you, Lord, for the recognition because you have your children who love you so much that they recognize certain things in, 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 the, in the main in their lives. Be it a pastor, a father, or a brother, a, a husband, a son, you know, we, uh, we we just grateful that we we are able to recognize uh, the uh, and compliment the men in our lives, in our families, and in our society. But over the years, over the years, this has been very difficult, you know, to realize recognizing men and complimenting men in society is being very difficult to realize. But along the same lines, I want us to look at a single verse in the New Testament. You have a Bible, please turn with me. I want us to look at a single verse in the New Testament. And the verse that I'm talking about is, you turn with me, Hebrews 11, verse, Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, verse 4. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Hebrews 11, verse 4. Hebrews 11, verse 4. A single, just one verse, Hebrews 11, 4. The Hebrews, you know, we, we, when we talk about Hebrews 11, we're right, away, right away we know we're talking about faith, right? That's the chapter that deals with uh, faith and talks about the heroes of faith or the hall of uh, faith in the Bible. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, verse 4. 
verse 4 says, uh, by, faith, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, that he, Abel, was righteous. God testifying of his gifts. So uh, what we just what I'm just reading here, God testified that Abel provided or gave the right gifts to him. So this morning, that's a very important for us to understand that God knows the kind of gifts that we offer to him. God knows the kind of gifts that we give to him, whether it's from our hearts or not. Whether it's, it's uh, just, you know, an afterthought or not, God knows. So he says what? By which he got, uh, by which he obtained witness that Abel was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And by it, he being dead yet speaking. And so today, even though Abel is dead, he still he speaks to you and to me today. This is what the Bible says in Hebrews 11 4. By it, because God testified, because God testified as to who Abel was. Today, Abel's testimony still resonates with you and with me. And you and I today, I believe we will love to see that our testimony will continue to reverberate even when the Lord has called us all until the Lord can. Why? Because we want God to testify of our gifts. We want the Lord God to testify of our faithfulness. We want the Lord God to testify of our commitment to Him. We want the Lord God to testify of who, of, of, of who we are and how we represent Him in society. It doesn't matter where or which society in which we find ourselves. We still want God to testify by the way we live, the faith that we have in Him, the trust that we have in Him, him, the love that we have for him, the devotion that we have to his word, the, the prayer, the time that we spend in his presence. So this is Abel. This is Abel. And Adam was his father. And this morning I wanted to talk a little bit about Adam. Not Abel at all, but I wanted to talk about Adam. Adam was his father and Adam was unique as a father. What do I mean by that? Well, as I was saying, these days being the dad or being the father is a difficult task. But it's not only these days. It's always been difficult from day one. Just like mothers, today we have single fathers. We have foster fathers. We have adoptive fathers. We have biological fathers. We have stepfathers. We have surprise fathers. We have father figures. We have what we call the pop culture, baby daddies. Even we even have what is called today absentee fathers. And you know, uh, a male parent, uh, an absent, uh, a male parent, uh, 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 an absentee father is a male parent who is what, uh, who is not home most of the time or none of the time with his children. See, and from pop culture, a baby daddy. A baby daddy is what is the biological father of a child that this this man had with a woman who now has little or no contact with him. So today, uh, we, we, it's been coined. This new phrase has been coined, uh, "baby daddy." See that? Now the man might take care of the child financially, but they might not, or he may not have the desire for a strong relationship with the child because of the mother. So we're talking about fathers. We're talking about those who have been able to, those who have young people in their care or young people in their care due to, uh, it could be due to legal or biological reasons. Now, when we look at all these types of fathers, the issue of godliness surfaces. Because the Bible has given us the instruction. God the Father has laid down uh, the role of the family, including the father and the mother and the children. Right. So when we talk about all these kinds of fathers, godliness, the, the, the topic of godliness rises up and the issue of godliness services. And so we ask, what is godliness? What is godliness? And a simple definition for the word godliness by, you know, by uh, biblical Greek definition, uh, the Greek word translated godliness is what well. in most of the English translations of the Bible means having a proper response to the things of God which produces obedience and righteous living. I'm going to say that again with the, the, 
the, the definition of godliness that we're working with this morning is what? It's, the, it's a proper response to the things of God which produces obedience and righteous living. So God is looking for godly fathers. Society is looking for needs. Society needs godly fathers. The church is looking for godly fathers so that the fathers can set example to the society, the community in which they live. Godliness. Godliness. We know that our Lord Jesus Christ was the unparalleled and perfect embodiment of pure godliness when he walked this earth. We know that. No question about it. No debate about that at all. But then there are some godly men in the Bible as well who, unlike Jesus, were fathers. For example, in Genesis, Genesis 1, chapters 1 to chapter 4, we read of Adam who was a father at a time when there was no instruction manual. When, when Adam became the father, there was no guy, there was no, there was no father before him. The only father example that he had was God. But you know, talking about it on the human on the human level, there was no example for him to emulate. There was no, like I said, there was no uh, guideline or book that he could consult and say, Oh, this is how to be a father. See, no instruction manual. As a matter of fact, uh, it will be downright impossible to talk about fatherhood or good father or father's day without ever mentioning Adam. That's why this morning I want us to look at Adam, all right? Now, while we don't have extensive details about Adam's fatherhood start in the Bible, the Bible says in Genesis 1, 27, it says that what? God created Adam and, and his wife Eve in his own image. We know that. And later, the couple went on to become parents. So they were created in God's image, and then later on, they became father and mother. Right? And then literally, literally, Adam was the first man on the earth. No way about it. No, no other way, no way around it. He was the first, and he was the first man that God created. The Bible says that in Genesis, right? So literally, which means that in terms of the role of a parent, he didn't have none, he didn't have any example to follow when his wife Eve gave birth to their children. See what I'm talking about? Now, according to Genesis chapter 5, you know, Adam and Eve's family consisted of, of the two sons, uh, uh, Cain and Abel, uh, Cain, not, not two, more than two sons, Cain and Abel and Seth, uh, including a minimum of other sons, Two other sons and two daughters. So in total, it adds up to seven. There are those who are debating that uh, because Adam lived a long life, 930 years or so, uh, he may have had more children. Well, uh, it, 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 that may well uh, that, that may well be the truth, but what the Bible says is what we're going with, right? So we know at least uh, seven children that Adam and Eve had. Now, Adam had to lean into his relationship with his heavenly father, which isn't a bad place to be. If this morning I'm talking to the fathers, at the same time to I'm talking to the mothers, at the same time to I'm talking to the whole church, that when we lean into our heavenly father, it is the best place to be because we are, you know, when we are in our God's hand, then what it means, what it means is that it means what? It means that we are hiding under the shadow of the Almighty. He is our father. So we lean into him. And so probably as a dad, Probably as a dad, Adam may have felt that he really was making it up as he went. Like I said, he didn't have a manual, he didn't have an example to follow, you know. And when you feel that way, when you feel that way, that, you know, you're making things up, then turn to God, the Father for direction is the wisest and the best thing to do. You know, so uh, Adam, uh, the, the Adam, the Adam had no, the Adam, like I said, probably he thought he was, he, he was making things up as he went along. But God was there. God was there and God was there. After all, after all, uh, uh, Adam was the father of all mankind, yet he was never a son. And sometimes, you know, uh, you, 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 you can be a good father because 
you were somebody's son, right? And so you learn from the mistakes of your dad. You learn from the best ways, lifestyle of your dad. You know, you learn things from your dad. But Adam didn't have that opportunity because he, he, he was not a son like you and I. Remember that when God created Adam, God didn't create Adam as a baby. When God created Adam, he created Adam full-grown man. That is why evolution is really, uh, is really a lie. You see the thing? So maybe you're thinking, uh, as you know, in the book of Genesis, God did not create, God did not, did not create a chicken or a seed. What we know is that God created fully grown things. For example, when somebody says, what comes from the chicken or the, uh, of the egg? You know, you know the answer. It is the chicken that comes from because God, God, what? Well, God created things full grown. So Adam, so Adam was a son and did not have an example to follow. And, and look what the Bible says, Hebrews 11 verse 1, or going on, Hebrews 11, as you know, like I said, it, it is a gallery of portraits uh, which is paraded before us. And this gallery or hall of faith was painted by the hand of God himself. God himself wrote or painted these pictures in Hebrews 11 about faith. Now, each picture represents the unique faith of these individuals who performed great exploits. They did great exploits because they trusted in the Lord, because they surrendered to God, and they walked by faith and not by sight. And this morning, I'm encouraging all of us, men and fathers in the church, to be a people who walk by faith and not by sight. Sometimes it's difficult, but yes, we know, we learn to trust, we learn to lean into God, because He is our Father. He is our Father. And the best way to lean into God or trust in God our Father is to go consult His Word and go on our knees in prayer. So these men in Hebrews 11, and women, these men and women yeah, in Hebrews 11, they, they believe the unseen. And you and I, this morning as we come to church, we believe the unseen because we know that because we know that even though even though we don't we don't, we don't see things physically, it doesn't mean that God is not there. Just like how the wind blows every day, we don't see the wind, but we feel the presence and the touch of the wind. Likewise, you and I, as believers, we believe in the unseen because we know God, our Father, created what all that we have, and one day He's coming back to pick us up all those. Who have given their lives to him. So these men and women in the Hebrews 11, they lived by faith and fully trusted God's promises. Not only that, but they also waited patiently for those promises to be fulfilled, sometimes never receiving them. And the, today, today in the church, we have, we have been taught to think that whatever we ask God, we ought to say, whatever we ask God, we ought to receive it. But you know what? Look at these men and women of faith in Hebrews 11. So many things that they prayed for, but, it was, but it, some of them did not receive it. Adam, what's the saying? Abraham didn't live to see uh, all the blessings that God promised him. But God has fulfilled his word just like he told Abraham, right? So, 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 so we walk, when we walk by faith, we trust God despite the situation in which we find ourselves. So that's why that these people, these men and women in uh, in Hebrews 11, they refuse what they refuse to what they refuse to allow themselves to be taken away. They refuse to allow themselves to be fooled. They 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 didn't allow persecution. They didn't allow pain. They didn't allow prison. They didn't allow peril. They didn't allow perplexity to weaken. Their faith. I'm going to say that again. These men and women of Hebrews 11, they trusted God. They trusted in uh, in the unseen. They built their faith on their uh, on their trust in God, so that they, even when there was persecution, even when there was peril or prison or pain or perplexity, things that they couldn't understand, they still did not allow their faith to be weakened. And this morning, I'm here to encourage you, to challenge you as a father and as the church. Don't allow the situation in which you're going through. Uh, weaken your faith, but rather trust in the Lord, depend on God, wait on God, and allow Him to lead you. And you will see how your faith will be fulfilled in your life, and you will live a life of joy in spite of what the enemy tries to, to place uh, in your mind. So they refuse to allow the threat of death or death itself 
They refuse to allow discouragement. They refuse to allow depression or disappointment or distrust to crush their faith and their devotion to God and their faith in God. You see that? You see that? They didn't allow any of that at all to depress them. One of these men of faith was able. One of these men of faith in Hebrews 11 was able. Now, this does say something about, uh, about something positive about Father Adam. Because I, we, remember, we're talking about Adam, right? And so the fact that Abel was, is mentioned in, he, uh, in Hebrews 11 tells you something about uh, uh, Adam's fatherhood. That he did something right. Even though Cain did something wrong or went the wrong way. You know what? You and I, we have been taught the word of God. You, are, you and I, we are being trained. And it's up to us how we live. So that's why we say in the family, a father and a, a uh, and the mother will raise their children by one or two or some of the other children will go the wrong way while others go the right way. See, so Adam did something right. Adam said did something right so that Abel, God, God himself testified on behalf of Ab Abel. You see that? I said, Father, Adam is teaching us some lessons. And in, in Genesis 1, 28, when God the Father immediately after creating Adam and Eve, commanding them to be what? To be fruitful and multiply, we see that fatherhood was one of the first jobs that God gave man. That God gave man. God gave that to both uh, man and woman. I'm, this morning we're talking about Adam, right? So now while Adam messed up big time, we all know what he did. We see that as a dad, his input gave Abel the faith that he needed so that he offered the right sacrifice to God. Because of the because of some tips and some directions and wisdom and guidance that Adam gave to his children, at least Abel listened so that Abel was was able to offer the right sacrifice to God Almighty. And that's why God testified on behalf of Abel. It's so it's so really it's so that unlike Abel, his younger brother came to the wrong path and fail to obey or worship God. And today, as fathers, you know, or, and, and as parents, sometimes we we, we have uh, taught our children, raised them the right way to go. And some, like I said before, some of them will go the right, dire right direction. The, the, the other will go in the wrong, the opposite direction. They fail to obey God or worship God. I got I got people who, who, who I got people that I'm praying for. The fathers have asked me to pray for the children because they raised them in the house of God. The children were raised in God's house, but today they've turned their backs on God and doing their own thing. They're walking away from God. They, you know, they, they're embracing the world. And so the, the parents, the father, asked Pastor, will, Pastor Andrew, will you pray with me? Continue to pray for them. And we continue to pray for them because we want to put them in heaven, not hell. So, so you as well, I know you also have people in your life that you're praying for. I have people in my life, in my, in my family, siblings that I'm praying for, that they, they, you know, their walk with the Lord will be, will be stronger. That, 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 friends, family, cousins, that their walk with the Lord will be better than it is today. So let us not give up on praying for our loved ones, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how a strange a relationship you have. We continue to pray for them. It could be between wife and husband. Whatever it is, we, we pray for their salvation. We pray for their salvation, right? So so so, so Adam Adam did uh, uh, pass on some godliness to his children. One went the right way, the other one went the wrong way. But you know what? There's a lesson that we can learn from Adam as a father, and it may be the best lesson we can take away from the story of Adam as we see in the Bible. The story of Adam, it is a bitter one. The lesson that we're going to learn, it, it is a bitter one, and it involves the consequences that can come when, as a father or not, we make wrong decisions. Look what the Bible says. Tell with me, Genesis chapter 3, Genesis, Genesis 3, 23 and 24. It's very important. Genesis 3, 23 and 24. Look at what it says. It says, Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden. So the Lord God sent Adam and Eve out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So, verse 24 says, so he drove out the man. See that? He drove out, God drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims 
and the flaming sword which turned every way to kick the way up of the tree of life. This is serious business. Because, because, like I said, we can learn our fathers, we can learn a lesson from Adam's mistakes. All right? Look at it. God drove them out. God drove them out of the garden. The, the garden of God. He drove them out because God is a holy God. And God, what God cannot tolerate sin at all. Sin cannot thrive in God's presence. So the Bible says, what? Well, it says what? Well, so verse 24, so he drove them out. So he drove them out. So he drove them out. And not only that, but when he drove them out, the Bible says what? Well, he placed what? Well, he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and the flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. That day, that day Adam learned that, you know, what it meant to sing and to be disciplined. I'm going to say it again. On that day, this, like I said, this is, very, this is very important. Let me go back a little bit again because I, I know you're taking notes. So look, look, look at it. I said we, this, the best lesson we can take away from Adam as uh, as a father is a bitter one, and it, it involves what it involves the consequences that can come when a, when as a father or not a father we make wrong decisions, and that's what we, that's what we're reading Genesis three twenty three twenty four, which says that God drove them out of the garden and placed what and placed a, 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 a cherubims. With a flaming sword, which turned every way to kick the way of the tree of life. You see that we can learn that lesson from Adam this day, this Father's day. That that day Adam learned what it meant to sin and to be disciplined and how to repent for the sins. So you and I will learn how to when we make mistakes, we learn what how to what how to ask for forgiveness. We we understand discipline and we learn to repent for our sins. We can learn that. Father, it doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter how long or how often you are wronging your wife and uh, the, the, and the mother of your children. It is time for you to stand in the gap. It is time for you to rise up and take, uh, take on the responsibility. It is time for you to show that yes, admit that yes, I made mistakes. I need that the, the discipline of God and I need to repent of my sins so that I can move on. And because they were ashamed, because Adam and Eve were ashamed, they were afraid of what. God God, their father, will, 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 will say or do to them. The Bible says they try to hide from him. But there's no hiding. You see, today you think God is not here physically, but God knows all that is going on, and you can't hide from him. I can't hide from him. So when we sing, we go to him, we repent. Say, Lord God, please, I messed up, forgive me. And us fathers want to do that. You see, eating from the tree made Adam understand the difference between good and evil. You see, so today, you and I, we know the difference between good and evil, which is knowledge that every father should pass down to their children. As, as, as daddies, and, and of course, as mothers, so as parents, and as adults in, in the life of children, we want to pass on to them the knowledge of good and evil. Today, look at what is happening. Today, in our society, they're trying to put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, light, light for darkness and darkness for light. You see, see that? So today they're teaching the children, little children, toddlers. They're trying to teach them that, well, you know, there are more than uh, 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 more than five genders, ten genders. That's what they're teaching the children today. So now they're teaching, they're teaching, uh, they're teaching our children lies as truth. You see that? But you and I, as parents, as adults, we want what we want to teach the children, like Adam did. You know the difference between good and evil. Because when Adam sinned, he learned. But today, because of sin, we rather want to dig deeper and deeper into lies, into sin, which is not right. See, and every every father should pass this knowledge on to their children. The truth. The truth about who we are as human beings. The truth about who we are as God created us. The truth about what God expects of us as his creation. See that? Adam is teaching us as a, a, a fatherhood a lesson. And I'm ending now, alright? Adam is, is teaching us a lesson. But there's only one perfect. You, you and I know that even though I, we're learning from Adam, there's only one perfect, one perfect example of a father for us all. He is in the Bible. He's in the Bible. 
And the Bible refers to him as our heavenly father. He is God and he provides the example that all of us need to follow. He gave the example to Adam and Eve. Unfortunately, they broke it because he gave them free will, right? And today, you and I, we also have the free will. And he, God has provided the example that we need to follow. During his time on earth, you know what I Jesus told us about God, his father. God, the father. Huh? He told us about God's perfect love for his children. And his children are who? You and me. You and me. And Jesus, Jesus told us that our Father in heaven, he, He's a great listener. He's slow to anger. He's the promise keeper. He's an excellent provider. He's the protector. He's a, he, he, he's a reliable guide and God through life. So as we go through life, when we trust in the Lord, He's guiding us and guarding us. See that? Just like those cherubims who were guarding the, uh, the Garden of Eden, our God guards us. He has his angels watching over us. That's what the Bible says, to keep us from falling, lest we dash our foot. You see, you see what, that's what the Bible teaches, to keep us in all our ways. See, so the best of us will fall short of perfection, and we're not perfect. But God's word provides us stories, true stories. Real stories of the joy and struggles of many godless biblical fathers. They have problems. Look at it. I mean, if you want to go through, uh, Abraham had problems. Uh, the, the Abraham had problems. Uh, David had, had problems. Samuel had problems. Eli had problems. You know, nobody's perfect. But, God, but we see God has given us an example of how to walk, just like Joseph, right? We, you know, we, like Joseph in, the, in Genesis, we want to walk faithfully with the Lord and our example will shine forth because we are learning to trust God and allow God to do his work through us and in us. See? So, and so we know that with all uh, the, uh, the Bible is, is telling us about all the joy and struggles of biblical fathers uh, to help us to help us become more like him, God, our Father, who is in heaven. You see, to help us in our, uh, 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 become more like God. That's what's happening. See that? So that in our lives and in our roles as fathers and as daddies, uh, we will what? We will rise up to the occasion. He's our Father who art in heaven. And so, Daddy, as we end now, take Proverbs 3, verse 5, and train your children in the way that they should grow, the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Huh? The Bible has given us the guidelines. Adam has taught us a lesson, a bitter lesson, that we should, certain things that we shouldn't do as fathers. We want to teach our children about God while they are young. We want to help them learn godly wisdom while they're at home, so that when they get old, they know where to go, they know what to hold on to, they know how to walk, how to dress, how to speak. They know what is right in God's sight. Then when they're old, they will look to God. Huh? They will not walk away, but they'll look to God the Father as their God and stand on his word, the Bible. What about if you are, if you are a grandfather? You know, you know, if you are a grandfather, you, you continue to do the same thing. You continue to pass on the knowledge, the experience, the wisdom, uh, what you've learned in life to your, uh, to your grandchildren. Mentor them. Mentor the young people around you. Mentor all those around you. And, and, and here as I end, I'm talking to, as I end, I'm talking to all, all the adults in Restoration Church now. It doesn't matter, grandmother, grandfather, uncle, auntie, uh, the single, whatever it is. So far as you're old and you have life experiences, it, it, it is incumbent upon you to do what? It is incumbent upon you to mentor the young ones in your lives so that they will also walk away and not be like Adam and Eve as they did, but walk in spirit and truth and in trust in the Lord. So you heard the message this morning. There's a lesson that we can learn from Adam as a father. You are a father. Maybe you messed up big time and you don't know how to make amends. The first thing you want to do is go on your knees and say, Lord God, please, I messed up. I need some help. I need some forgiveness and guidance. I need the words that I need to say, the approach I need to take so I can make things right in the life of my children or my child. God will hear you. God will hear and God will answer. 
Yes, a short prayer that you can pray for those who listen to me but are not born again. Want to be, want, you want to be born again. You, you can be a good earthly father, but if you don't have Christ in your life, you're not going to be in God's presence. You're not going to be in God's presence. You'll find your way into hell. So this is a short prayer. Dear Lord, I heard your word this morning, and I know I'm not born again. I have a family. I have children. I know my ways are not perfect. I just want to give my life to you so that I can train my children to grow in you, to know you. So please accept me as one of your children. I surrender all to you. And I pray this short prayer in Jesus' name. If you pray this prayer, it's very easy. Please, you know, you can reach, uh, reach back to us. We show you how to, be, uh, how to be a child of God, how to grow in spirit, how to mature in spirit. So that God will bless you. So that you, you, you know you, you are secure. Secure. For eternity. Shall we please pray. And we will receive the benediction. We thank you Heavenly Father for today. We thank you for the day that I have been set aside to honor fathers. First of all, mighty God, we honor you because you are our Father. You have laid down your word, guidance. You've shown us how much you love us protect us. You've done so much for us and continue to do so much for us. So we want to say thank you. Please Heaven Father, pray that you continue to have your hands on your children. Let them know that you have your hand on them, oh God. Please. Please. Your children, please touch them. Transform them. Strengthen them. You give them the joy. The joy the joy that they're looking for. We bless you, glorify, we pray, and we thank you in Jesus' name. May the Lord God bless you and keep you. May the Lord God make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord God lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. May the peace of God with us all understanding rest and abide with you all now and forevermore. Amen.